everyone. Uh, welcome to this Growing Manchester webinar on gardening and wildlife with kids. I'm Emily Corner from Social Enterprise So the City and this webinar is part of a programme we run called Growing Manchester funded by the NHS to improve access to sustainable food in Manchester and increase the health and well-being of the wider community. So this is our seventh webinar. Um, they've been going well. Uh, it, um, lots and lots of different topics and most of them you can find on on Vimeo, the recorded uh, presentations. And if you want any more information about any of them, please get in touch. Um, the, the first of our second block of webinars, so we've another six planned. So I've got Stuart Bowman with me today and he's helping me to run this webinar. Stuart has over 10 years of experience of working in Manchester Primary Schools running gardening activities with children and families. Um, so me and Stuart have around 40 minutes to talk to you about how to get growing at home with kids as well as lots of easy to do nature, wildlife and forest school type activities. You can get kind of minimum minimum resources um, and just, uh, just taking advantage of um, what's out there, I suppose. So, right, uh, the presentation. So here's the content. We're just gonna uh, we're gonna have a bit of a brief introduction to um, why getting outside is important and um, how how it can uh, benefit your mental and physical health. Um, specifically, what the benefits of gardening are, a gardening in nature are for children. Um, gardening with children. So just some ideas of different activities from Stuart about what you can do inside and outside. And then I'll go into a few forest school inspired activities, uh, some wildlife activities, and then we're just going to give you a big long list of um, different websites and things that you can go to um, to find more ideas and um, more resources. Uh, I've been working for Silver City uh, for um, two years now, and um, I guess I get a lot of the uh, I end up doing a lot of the sessions in schools and with kids and with families and youth groups and things like that. Um, and we, uh, so the city we work in all different kind of settings, um, different age groups. So um, I've got a bit of experience of, of working in um, with kids and things. And this is uh, this is a nice picture of um, a, a school that we work we work in in, in Fallowfield, Ladybound Primary, and we've been there. Uh, about six or seven years and we go a couple of times a week uh, and just pff, engage the kids in gardening but also in wildlife activities and just anything to get them outside it tends to be nurture groups um, and maybe kids with special educational needs and looked after children and things like that but of course I think it you know it benefits everyone to get outside and get a bit dirty and get a bit hands-on with kids um, and only found out afterwards that these are typically children who are a problem in the classroom um, it's up indoors so whether it's being outside and this kind of calming effect of nature or getting hands-on or because there's less pressure and no kind of preconception on my part the kids just um, seem to enjoy it you know and they don't act, act out as much and they, they just get involved um, I think it's really a really great thing I think, it's, you know, specifically for children, I think the earlier the better in um, getting them outside and embedding those environmental values and exposing them to nature. Um, a couple of different campaigns I, I kind of had a look at. There's this, uh, the Personal Dirty is Good campaign revealed that three quarters of UK children spend less time outdoors than prison inmates, which is, which is quite shocking. So that's less than the mandate is 60 minutes a day. I spend twice as long playing on screens as playing outside. Uh, a three-year study by the RSPB found that less than one in ten children regularly played in wild spaces compared to half of children a generation ago. So we're suffering, you know, we're suffering from what's been termed this nature deficit disorder. The idea that human beings and especially children are spending less time outdoors, which can lead to long, a long and complex list of problems, um, mental and physical health. Um, but on a on a positive note, you know, there's loads of research out there about the massive benefits that gardening being outside in nature can have for kids. So there's uh, improved mental and physical health. Um, if you want to know more about this, John spoke a lot about the benefits of nature on health and well-being in a previous webinar on green well-being 
so I won't go into it too much, but being outdoors and being around or even looking at nature benefits our mental physical health. It can be something as small as being in the garden, going for a walk, or even looking at nature has been, uh, been shown to have positive physical health implications. Uh, so I mean, it's more vitamin D, it improves your blood pressure, it's, um, it has benefits to your nervous system, boosts your immune system, relaxes you, puts you in a better mood. Children who get involved in lots of outdoor activities have more positive environmental attitudes, which I kind of mentioned before, which can only be good, um, can lead to more environment focused thinking and action in their lives. So this is quite a few studies on school gardening programs and how they increase the amount and variety of fruit and vegetables that children eat. So healthier diets, hopefully from getting involved in gardening. Open spaces encourage more physical exercise, um, help to, helps to develop motor functions as well when you're jumping over things and digging and climbing on things and uh, wheelbarrowing and things like that. And it's also um, encourages imagination and uh, inspires lots of um, different activities. So open space, plants, sticks and leaves and bugs and all that kind of thing and a lack of restriction encourage free play and similarly uh, an outdoor setting can be stimulating and help, help to coax children out of their shells and that those exciting surroundings can engage kids who might find an indoor setting really boring or really stifling so that's just a few of the benefits that um that doing gardening and being outdoors and being within nature can have um, for kids and in my experience and, and looking at some of this kind of in-depth research that's out there. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Stuart now who is going to tell you a bit about his experience of working in schools and give a few suggestions of some growing and gardening activities that you can do with kids at home now. Thanks Emily. Um, I'm going to spend about 10 or 15 minutes um, just running through some some possibilities of what you could do at the moment in mid-May. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about exactly how to do each thing but I just want to sort of make you aware of things that maybe you weren't aware of previously. But I've no idea about people's level of experience who, who are on the, the webinar today so I don't want to bore people by spending 10 minutes to tell you how to plant peas. So I want to include some ideas for um, doing things inside because not everybody has got a wonderful garden. Uh, so it's good to, and, and there are things that we can do growing um, inside the house without having any access to a, to a garden or open space. Um, and some things that we could do outside as well for those of us who have, who are lucky enough to have that. A couple of things that we, I just wanted to mention, but particularly if you're working with younger people or children who love literature and stories, is there's a whole world of and, and often classical fairy stories or films that have really strong gardening and environmental themes in, so that you can easily make some, some links and refer back to some of these when you're working in the garden with children. You know, things like, I mean, the obvious ones are things like Jack and the Beanstalk, but there's yeah, Peter Rabbit and the Lorax, and I'm sure everybody out there knows other things as well. Um, that can be a really nice way to combine what you're doing in the garden with some other, some other sort of aspects of, of learning. You might be like me at the moment and have a child at home who you're, you know, desperately trying to do some homeschooling with, um, and or you might work in a school. I could see there's a couple of people on the, the webinar who, who do work in school settings. And there's, you know, there's, there's millions of ways that you can link in gardening activities and the other curriculum. And I, I don't mean just sort of science elements or environmental elements, but simple maths are really, is really easy. Primary school maths is really easy to link in with gardening, whether it's, it's sort of down at the early years sort of level of counting and counting in twos and, and then moving up into simple additions and multiplications when you're working with seeds or measuring using rulers to space out your seeds properly there's all that sort of stuff and literature you know imaginative stories 
um, building children's vocabulary as well. This this can all come from um, you can all link this in with gardening activities. And so don't feel bad if your child or the young some of the young people you work with just don't like it because it's it isn't for everybody. So I think I think it's worth saying as well because I think there's a lot enough pressure on particularly on parents right now to be providing all these amazing educational um, opportunities and making everything fun and wonderful for children in lockdown so you know I wanted to start with a few simple inside activities so one thing you can do all year round is sprout seeds this is really easy there's loads of instructions on the internet um, I do this quite regularly at home um, and essentially you get some seeds you soak them in some water for a, usually a day overnight and then you you drain the seeds put them in a jar and give them a wash drain them from the water so they're they're not dry but they're not sitting in water and then you leave them for a few days and depending on the seed in two days maybe a few more they will start to sprout the reason I put this in is a it's it's an inside activity you can do and also it's really fast you see results really really quickly for some children that's that's an important thing to keep them motivated and engaged to have some quick results I've put some examples there of things you can you can sprout uh, but these th this this works it's easy to do you don't need any special equipment a jar and an old tea towel and an elastic band you do this Another thing you can do inside again with no special equipment is if when, when you've used uh, vegetables, often a, the bit at the end that you've cut off or you don't eat, you can often use to regrow <clears throat> the plant. There's some examples here. Um, I've got one sitting on our kitchen table at the moment, which is a lettuce that we used most of and just sliced off the end and sat it in sort of half covered in water in a cup a bit like on the picture here and it really does work it, it looks like the one on the picture the one in our kitchen it's grown leaves again out of the top <clears throat> and this has been quite quick it's taken about a week so this is a, a quick result thing uh, Emily you said you've done this with onions as well and it's worked is that right I don't know oh oh you can do it with spring onions yeah yeah, <clears throat> um... yeah. carrots well I don't know I've tried it all I got is a soggy mess but you can have a go. Um, these definitely do work. And again, it's simple. It's stuff that you might have around the house already. No, nothing special to, to use there. What you can do is often we have <clears throat> in our kitchens that have a seed in the middle. Just getting, you know, saving that seed and looking at it or getting children involved in, in preparing food and finding that's where, this is where seeds come from. Interesting activity as well can often use these to grow things to grow a plant now you probably won't replicate the plant that you've taken the seed from <clears throat> and these are tropical plants that won't just won't grow in in britain things like dates are really quite simple to to germinate um, and again all, all you need to do usually is um, seed and then put it in either some water they will often root just sitting in water or some compost or failing that you know just some dirt out of the garden or from somewhere if you haven't got a garden if you can steal a cup full of dirt from somewhere often grow i'm starting to talk about putting soil in things and don't be worried if if you haven't got special garden plant pots you know anything that holds soil is a plant pot so yogurt pots all that sort of kitchen waste products that we all probably have bodge a hole in the bottom so it drains water and you've got yourself a plant pot yeah a tetra pack a, a milk bottle plastic milk bottles you know you cannot use all of these things a couple of examples there but you can try anything you know and, and have a go see if it works or not these generally take a bit longer than the first two so it's good to have your quick wins and then maybe have some of these longer term things going as well Here's a runner bean crop in a, from a primary school I used to work in. Um, peas and beans are really good to grow. It's a, it's a good time of year to do them now. Most of us being confined to home, space can be a, a bit of an issue. 
So I think it's worth thinking about growing things outside which go up. They use minimal space and in, on, on the ground and they'll utilize the, the vertical space that, that, you, that you might have. Beans, I've chosen those because they're kids like eating them. Even if they say they don't, if they've planted some fresh peas, they, you know, my experience is that those beautiful, fresh, sweet peas, kids will eat them. And May is a classic time to plant these sort of things. You can either, you can buy seeds online if you, if you haven't got a seed shop near you. Or to plant, you can just put them straight in the ground. You might get better results if you start them off in a pot or a tray and then transplant them, move them to their final place once they've created and grown about a few inches high. If you've got space, they, I mean, radishes don't take up a lot of space, but they won't use that vertical space that we've got. <clears throat> the thing about these is they're quick. Planting radish seeds to getting a radish is usually about four to six weeks, depending on your soil and the weather. They're a bit smaller, so they can be, can be a little bit tricky for some younger ch or children who might struggle a bit with fine motor skills. Peas and beans are good for that. They're, they're nice bulky seeds. They're easy to hold. But radishes, again, simple to grow. Make a little trough in the ground, sprinkle your seeds in, not too close together, but you, you can find the instructions online somewhere. A good quick option. Lucky enough to have more space, I've some things that classic things that you could grow in the garden now. Pumpkins. Kids are often really fascinated by growing pumpkins. And they do run, they take up a lot of room, but if you can get some fairly strong wooden sticks or canes, they will grow up as well. You don't have to, they don't have to spread horizontally across the ground. Now, all of these things will take more time to grow. So these are more of an, a, a longer term nurturing type gardening project, but they're, they're all, pretty straightforward to grow uh, there's nothing particularly things that kids pull out of ground like carrots you know it's a and it's a really nice moment when you pull out a carrot from the ground uh, things that you can do right now in may hopefully just a quick overview of some things you can do inside with minimal resources <clears throat> through to some more complicated so you can grow outside which to be honest not that complicated and you should get decent results from them thanks okay thank you Stuart. Um... That's great. Um, go on now to talk um, more about some more kinds of activities, um, more kind of wildlife and nature based things. Uh, so you probably heard of forest schools before, and I know that um, people who joined in today have experience of um, forest schools. Um, it's just one particular way of working. It's, it's children in nursery and preschool settings and at holiday clubs and um, as kind of a supplement to school classes. But it, it can be tailored to lots of different groups and uh, in lots of different outdoor spaces. Forest school practitioners, as they, as they call them, um, they work with children over a long period of time. Um, it is tend to be using that outdoor setting, nature, teamwork skills, resilience, confidence, independence, and creativity. So I was lucky enough to receive a training bursary in a previous job to undertake the forest school level three course a couple of years ago. It was a really good learning experience. Um, and I think, you know, having a, an accredited trainer running sessions is great, but, but there's so many of these ideas, uh, these forest school inspired activities that anyone can take and do um, at home in their own gardens or um, out in the park or, you know, in, in nature spaces. And, and, and different settings with really um, minimal resources. Some of this kind of activities uh, that maybe you'd see within forest schools. So they usually in this woodland setting, using natural objects to build things, to do nature art, learn about different things. So it's been outdoor cooking and, and bushcraft, tree climbing. So it's all about allowing children um, to explore and learn and play in in that safe and supportive natural environment. So often they talk uh, about um, monitored risk as well. So letting kids do what might be considered um, dangerous, I suppose, but really um, working in small groups or one on one um, and keeping that risk to a minimum so that um, children could use um, tools uh, or, or can light fires um, or construct dens and tr climb trees and learn those motor skills. 
but in a really safe setting. But I'm just going to go through a couple of activities in uh, detail and then I'll send out lots of resources for you to have a look at afterwards. Um, so first is this thing, uh, Hapazome, which, which is a really great activity that I keep coming back to over and over again. Uh, it, the, the phrase is Japanese uh, and it literally translates to leaf dye. So it's the process of transferring the natural pigments from leaves and flowers onto fabric and paper. Uh, and you can do this with uh, some flowers and even things like beetroot and orange peel, anything that's got lots of colour in. And you can, you know, I've done it in lots of different uh, settings in schools and with youth clubs. And um, all you need is a bit of fabric. So, um, maybe a bit of cotton or uh, muslin or, or a piece of paper and you need something to hit something to bash it with uh it could be like a rubber mallet like these uh these girls have here or you can use a stone or maybe even a rolling pin or um a block of wood so take uh, your base kind of plank piece of wood here lay your natural items out put your piece of fabric or paper on top and then just kind of bash through, uh, bash the colour so that it transfers onto the fabric. And then depending on how careful you were or how hard you bashed, you'll get kind of a different result. Uh, can, if you're really careful, you can often get the outlines of all the individual parts of the plant imprinted onto the piece of fabric or paper. And it's just a really nice thing to do and uh, you can do over and over again with the different materials that you find. Uh, we just keep going back to it over and over again. It's really fun and I think it's I think it's fun for anyone adults and children and someone actually that does hapazomi and makes um, and prints on on fabrics and makes clothes from them and they're really beautiful fabrics um, of course after a while those those colors will fade so uh, I haven't looked into it myself but I'm sure you can get kind of fixatives and um, different things to keep the colors intact let's talk a bit about shelter building now Getting into shelter building uh, be as simple or as complicated as you want to make it. And I think it's just really exciting and fun. And um, I've done sessions on tribes before, you know, set up your tribe, set up your shelter, think of a tribe name. I mean, it could just be that you uh, chuck in a tarp, so like a ground sheet or, a, or just a, a bed sheet over a washing line or making an indoor fort. Or you might want to go as far as getting it out into the woods and taking your ground sheet and your kind of your rope with you and things, trying out some of these kinds of uh, shelters. Um, and the more you do it, the more, the more, uh, the better you'll get at it. Obviously, some of these look quite complicated. Uh, but, um, some are super, super simple. You can start to look into uh, tying and how to attach rope um, or branches to trees to create that base for your shelter. There's loads of great scout association resources you can have a look at to find out about basic knots and what they can be used for. Kids really get into this um, and I've done like I've done a whole session on um, tying knots to make throwing stars uh, and throwing these at kind of their targets for different points and things and making it a bit of a competition. So that's it can be really fun but I, obviously you know other people other kids and adults it, it can be really frustrating to tie these different knots so I just want to see how how um you know how people respond to that but uh, this is more your um natural shelters this one uh, your tarps and things I mean uh, you, you'll be able to buy a ground sheet or a tarp all in or a ground sheet online or often you can find them in in camping shops um as well I mean I've just used um, washing line before and it's not ideal because it can kind of splay and all the ends can come out but you sort of like melt them with a, a match or a lighter or something to seal them off and you might want to have a go at natural shelter building as well here's just a, a few ideas and I know um, I went for a walk around Ivy Green in Charlton um, the other day and there's some amazing natural shelters that people built in amongst the woods there um, with not even using rope actually just um, just some branches against branches and I suppose you want to be careful you know that it's all secure and things like that before before getting inside uh, as you use some of this brash and things to, to cover up the holes and and some of these more stable poles as a as base to your shelter I want to talk a bit about wildlife activities now as I've been walking around um, recently outside uh, I've started to hear the birds a lot more there's a lot of things coming into leaf um, 
as the more and more time you spend outside, the more you see the seasons come and go. You can print out these little ID sheets in all different types of things, and I'll show you a few of them. Uh, quite, you know, interesting to go out and really look at things and what you might have considered as just a patch of grass or a patch of weeds. When you get up close and you start looking through, you can see those individual flowers and um, and seed heads and different types of grass even. For bird ID, um, it's, I think it's maybe best to start off with some of the uh, common and uh, most easy to identify birds. Really great nature detective sheet. So the Woodland Trust did this nature detectives um, project for a while and they're a little bit harder to get hold of now uh, sheets, but um, you should be able to find them. And, and you can see that these are all just uh, quite common birds that you'd find in your garden or in the woods or um, simple uh, maybe sheets. So I think bug ID is really great because it's so hands-on. Um, encourages kids and adults to tackle those fears maybe of uh, of bugs and mini beasts and um, you can get really simple sheets like this one and you know you might want to go looking around under stones and um, uh, one way you can you can find bugs is to lay uh, a sheet out under a bush and just shake the bush and you'll see that lots of things can fall down um, spiders and um, flies and things um, and then you can even get right in there into the uh, into the ID of individual things. So um, you can get really simple sheets or complicated ones, um, or different species of bees and butterflies. And here we've got some slugs. So a um, bit of uh, trivia here that there are actually 40 species of slugs found in the UK. Really amazing ones, some leopard slugs and things that I've seen quite a bit. And you'll see they're all different shapes and sizes and colours. Um, 31 species of earthworm in the UK too. So when you really start to look closely, there's, uh, there's so much diversity. Um, a really nice wildflower sheet. So again, there's some, there's loads of great resources online. Um, the Field Studies Council, I think do some of the best ID sheets. And um, I've got a link to their website at the end of the uh, presentation. But what they have is they have really nice fold out clear, sheets uh, with the most common types of flowers or bugs or birds and things to be found in specific um, habitats so I mean just google it you know it's, there's, so, there's so many ID sheets out there. Um, talk a bit about homes for wildlife as well so improving your outdoor space uh, have one you know or, or the limited space that you have for wildlife is a, a aging activity and you can see how uh, these things will change over time and if they're used by wildlife I suppose and then use those ID sheets and 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 see who's visiting your garden you might want to plant some wildflowers so you can do that all year round and you know, it should just take a couple of months for things to come up the best time of year to um, wildflower seeds is in the autumn so that they can establish and um, you'll get some early blooms then in the spring but just do this in pots or containers uh, or you can dig up uh, if you've got a lawn and you uh, have to sacrifice an area of your lawn uh, dig away the turf there seeds down rake them in a um, layer of soil on top um, come up and what they really like wildflowers is those poor nutrient deficient soils so so taking away that turf and not adding any compost or anything like that is what they is what they want and, and you know eventually uh, they'll take over again uh, keep pulling away that material that dies down at the end of the year after it's seeded then you will keep getting some flowers um, uh, another one is uh, habitat piles so you see on the top left here just a pile of branches and I was speaking to Stuart about this earlier but we we've both taken time and made these bug hotels that you kind of see in lots of different places now but really what you want is just a pile of sticks or a few logs which are brash because that's the that is the perfect habitat for these for these bugs and and also for birds to feed on those insects a, a, a really positive thing to do for wildlife if you have the space in your garden of course there's a bird box here so buy box kits online or you can buy them ready-made uh, or you can uh, chunk of wood and there's plenty of these plans online but they'll tell you the sizes to cut to uh, how to put them together and then 
size holes on the front are for different size birds. So depending on which birds you, you'd like to use your bird box, uh, you use a different hole. And then what you've just got to make sure is that it's about three meters up uh, tree or, or up, up your house or something like that, and that it's not in direct sunlight. Um, and then hopefully you should uh, should encourage some birds into your garden. Yeah, so that's that's about it now. That's uh, this is just uh, an introduction really into all the different things that you can look into. Um, loads and loads of links here to different websites where you can find a bit of inspiration of what you can do at different times of year or sheets, um, all different types of apps and things like that. We'll go back through some of your um, comments in the in the chat box, and if anyone has any more questions, please just type them in. And uh... I think we I think we skipped over a bit was in our planting and growing mm. was we didn't say much about flowers. We talked about mm. we talked about smashing up flowers with with rolling pins yeah. and and identifying them. How about growing flowers? Are, are there any that you'd recommend that are good to grow? Oh, so you can be yeah. planting right now, yeah. start them off inside or in May or in, in late May, you can plant them straight into your garden. So that's always a nice thing to do and to grow them and see how high they, they get, you know, have a bit of a competition. Um, you can get all different sizes, can't you, different colours and double headed sunflowers, save the seeds at the end and plant again the next year. The wildflowers as well, you know, you can buy mixed packs of wildflowers or you can buy specific one, so uh, you could buy just uh, seeds or, or just corn flowers or something like that. All, all those things that grow well in the, in, in the UK and that you see in the countryside will be, you know, quite easy to grow. Now yeah. we, have a, we have a question from Mr. Cleveland. Oh, okay. Who uh, wants to know what would be good flowers to grow in the cracks of paving stones? Wow. So we can, prob we can probably think that that's not going to be high quality soil, is it, with Scott? Because it depends if you're going to be walking on the paving stones as well and damaging the, the flowers. Um, see little um, wild pansies kind of growing in that situation, don't you? Or um, Herb Robert, sort of all these hardy kinds of things. Um, Would some of your wildflower mixes be good, toss, just scattered down the cracks of paving stones you think yeah why not have a go they like kind of pioneer species in a way they like that really poor soil and the, those um conditions so it's worth a go thing you could try in something like that is to grow some herbs we didn't i didn't really mention this but things like mint oh, is it, really really tough and it's it, it grows really well uh, it's easy to to grow as well because if you if you buy some mint from a shop and you put it in water, just one of the stems, after a few days, it will start to make little roots. And when it does that, you can then put it into the ground. So if you could, if it's possible to dig down a little bit between the cracks of your paving stones and plant the mint in there and then cover the roots back up with some soil, mint doesn't mind about being in bad quality soil. You can get your hands on ones that have already grown in the way that I described. You can get mint to reproduce itself just by putting it in some water. That will often work with different kinds of herbs as well. You can take cuttings from herbs. There's lots of information about that online. It's quite easy to do. Um, and you can do that either from the cut herbs you might buy in a greengrocer's shop. I've never had much joy with these ones you buy in the supermarket where they say it's a living plant and it's going to carry on for years and years. I think they uh, they pump them up with whatever, don't they? So they look the best in the shop and then they're not so happy and they're very um, compact. There's lots of plants within one pot so they don't have so many nutrients and, and space to grow. Get them home. Maybe if you split them up and you put them into new soil and into different pots, that might be one way to save them. I mean, Hebe's made a great comment about potatoes here. Getting towards the end of the time now where you could plant potatoes, but if you if you get cracking, you could maybe get some of those in and Hebe's trying to grow them just from the peeling as long as, I think what you need to do there is make sure you've got the, the eye of the potato in your peeling and you can just put that in the ground. And certainly in different times in history, that's how people have grown potatoes. You can spare a potato or two, just chuck them, chuck them in the ground about six inches down and see what happens. So it's a bit late, but 
you know, you might get some results by the autumn if you did that now. Got some good ideas here of uh, finding the longest cucumber or heaviest yeah. pumpkin, things like that. Yeah, it's always uh, nice to, to have something to aim towards uh, to encourage you know, that ongoing interest, I suppose. Well, you started talking about health and safety, Emily, as well. Yeah. Just before. Yeah. Well, I think it's just something we'd mentioned before, and it might be uh, those limiting factors uh, outside and using tools, I suppose. But I think in, in my experience in different school settings and working with families and things, um, very few uh, accidents, low for risk. Uh, I don't know wh whether you've had any tricky situations, Stuart, but... Um... I've never had any significant injury to anybody in 10 years of doing this in primary schools the, the I, I think the the most dangerous thing is spraying dirt around when you're digging <laughs> and getting dirt in your eyes so be careful how you position yourself relative to other people i'd say so if you have people facing each other they're highly likely to throw dirt in each other's faces um, i think it's a bit like cycling you know the cycling that's going to kill you it's the it's the not exercising so it's, mm. I don't think you're going to get hurt by gardening. It's, it's not getting outside that's going to do more damage to you. You have something that you yeah, want to well, talk just, about? Just thinking, at, you know, at some point, we're going to reopen. Uh, I can see some people here on the call are <clears throat> in schools already, but if you're not, you might be keen to have your child's school do some gardening if they're not doing it already. I just wondered, um, Emily, is there, a, is there any advice you'd give to people who are maybe wanting to get their school into doing some gardening? Uh, yeah, well, we work at a few different schools, but we also have um, some schools who are part of our Growing Manchester programme. In Manchester um, groups can receive free uh, sessions, advice and training. So if you would like to if you like some help and some advice you know you can join that program or you can just get in touch with us suppose what you do need is you need some you need people who are interested and uh, who are willing to put the time and the effort into setting things up in that school setting because um time and effort um to find those things that you can grow during term time uh, don't take too much maintenance uh, might be that you have some outdoor space that you can use within your school or you might be wanting to grow just on the windowsill. Uh, you know, there's loads to do. And there's, there's so much specific information to growing in schools out there as well, uh, online, how, how you can uh, link it into the curriculum and how uh, the more schools doing this, the better, I think. Anything else to add? Pretty quick, I think if you're a parent and you want your school, your child's school to be doing some of this, it's tempting sometimes to go to the to, you know to the head and start talking about this sort of thing, but it might be worth just finding out who are your allies in the school. You know who are who are the teachers or the teaching assistants who are really interested in this. Um, get them interested first, I would I would say, because um, then it's it's often a lot easier than if you can approach the school and you've already got some interest from a from a member of staff who might be willing to take this on as a lunchtime club or an after school club or something like that and hopefully some of the activities we've talked about today could show you that there's, there's a whole range of things that you can do with absolutely minimal equipment and resources so from a school point of view they're not having to spend lots of money to to do this they can you can start small and simple and it doesn't it really doesn't take a lot and you're still providing a really engaging experience for children so I think that's about it then uh thanks so much Stuart for for your help for your input no, well, um, it's been good. yeah, yeah. Thanks, um, thanks for all the comments and, for, for, to everybody yeah. as well it's some interesting thank, contributions there yeah. yeah thanks everyone for for joining in uh, this week's um webinar is i think is instruction to beekeeping that should be a really good one and uh, again that that will be at fr uh, next friday at 10 a.m thanks so much and i hope you all have a lovely weekend hope to see you um all again soon